brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus in secula. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Happy to be joined once again by the biblical scholar, Dr. John Bergsma. Dr. Bergsma, thank you for coming on the show again today. Absolutely, Tim. Always my pleasure. So we're today we're talking about Jeremiah, and we've got links below if you want to sign up for the Emmaus Academy. It's a great uh, resource for forming Catholic minds and souls and hearts, especially through the Holy Scripture. And you have a course right now called the 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 Major Prophets, which goes through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And we've we've already talked to you about Isaiah. So you can click the link below to join the Emmaus Academy. It's cost twenty five dollars a month, which is a steal for the the quality of education that you get at the Mayus Academy. So Dr. Bersma, what what's what's new with you? What are you working on? You have new courses coming out with the Academy or what what's going on with you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've got a new course uh, that's in the works um, on an overview of the New Testament. And uh, so that'll be fun. Uh, probably find a way to incorporate some of my, uh, uh, you know, copyrighted uh, stick figures uh, in that at some point. Um, so looking forward to uh, to working on that project. I'm working on a um, commentary on the book of Deuteronomy for the Catholic Commentary and Sacred Scripture series out of Baker Bookhouse. And, you know, Mary Healy, Scott Hahn have contributed to that uh, already, and uh, they gave me the honor of working on Deuteronomy. So uh, looking forward to finishing that. Um, also working on a, a textbook with a bunch of uh, an ecumenical group of Pentateuch scholars. We're working on a, a, a textbook on the Pentateuch for theological students and for clergy, uh, trying to get away from the dead and, uh, and deadifying, <laughs> if that's a word, uh, paradigms of the 19th century, uh, the uh, documentary hypothesis, etc., that really obfuscates uh, the meaning of God's word. And we're experimenting with other paradigms for understanding uh, the first five books of Moses. And uh, for the first time, this uh, consortium of about 30 uh, Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish scholars that I've been working with, we're putting together a textbook uh, on the Pentateuch for use in uh, colleges and seminaries. And so that's really exciting. And uh, we hope that will move the needle a bit on um, biblical scholarship uh, worldwide. That is a very exciting project because of, yes, it is indeed deadifying. Uh, it's it's, <laughs> it's ki killing. It's killing of the soul. This, this, this academic, uh, uh, really these atheists, really these, these men who didn't right. even believe in the Bible, right. but they, they made it their pet project to just dissect right. everything. And, uh, yes. yeah, thank you. I, this, this is, this is fantastic because it's unfortunate, even in, even many Catholic seminaries, people who question things like the documentary hypothesis would, you know, be ridiculed because they thought, you know, they were so, they had this, uh, you know, inferiority complex with all these smart people who knew Hebrew so well, you know? So that's great. I, I'm so excited about that. And um, so one question about the Catholic commentary series, is that a, is that a series of books published by Baker Bookhouse? Yeah, they've got it into the, the Catholic field and um, they've been doing, New Testament volumes, so and and those have been great. So Father Pablo Gadens on Luke, uh, Mary Healy on Mark, um, Curtis Mitch and Ted Shree on Matthew, uh, just fantastic stuff. Um, Scott Hahn has a contribution. I believe it was either Romans or Hebrews. Uh, please forgive me for not uh, remembering at the moment uh, exactly which he contributed to that series. Um, but uh, but just a whole bunch of uh, really fantastic works in the New Testament. And now they're moving that series into select Old Testament books. Now, obviously, Old Testament not as popular as, say, the Gospel of John. But uh, nonetheless, they made a selection of, you know, key books of the Old Testament that are really significant. Um, the Pentateuch, uh, you know, Genesis through Deuteronomy, uh, those are foundational. So they farmed those out to a bunch of different scholars and um, some of the prophets uh, will be in that series as well. So I'm really excited about that. that that's really exciting. It's great that Baker Bookhouse, which is a Protestant publisher, is yeah. is promoting this Catholic stuff. It's great. Um, great. So let's talk about Jeremiah. So this is part of our uh, Bible reading group. So 
this is uh, what we do at Meeting of Catholic. Part of our our, our penance group is uh, we, we offer penances for priests and seminarians. And some of us also do this Bible reading. So this is and this is a liturgical Bible reading plan based on the traditional office of Matins, which Matins goes through most a good chunk of the Bible, not, not all. So this Bible reading plan is based on that and then adds all the things that are missing. So right now we are just entering into the almost the fifth week of Lent, which is traditionally known as Passion Tide. And this is when the divine office really changes dramatically and the gospel readings change dramatically because there's the feeling of the confrontation that our Lord is having with the Jewish leaders more and more. And in particular, the divine office takes a ton from Jeremiah. And right. um, especially also at the Triduum, there's the chanting of the lamentations of Jeremiah after Jeremiah, after the prophecy. Um, so we read through, in addition to finishing numbers, uh, we read through all of Jeremiah and lamentations and Baruch. So the whole Jeremiah trilogy uh, nice. is read during this time. So that, and this is, so if you want to join this group, it, this is a prayer group. And because in order, just like what you were just saying, Dr. Bergsman, like there's a, there's been an academic takeover of biblical studies so that the Bible has, is no longer a prayer book, no longer a, a you know, it has its true place in the liturgy, in prayer. It's just this academic exercise. So this is part of just promoting lay reading of the Holy Scripture in a way where lay people can profit spiritually from the Holy Text. So my first question, Dr. Bergsma, is what are some things that you would advise for lay people to spiritually profit from reading Jeremiah in particular? Yeah. Uh, one big thing that comes immediately to mind is when you're reading Jeremiah, keep in mind the strong typological relationship between Jeremiah and our Lord. Uh, it's not accidental that in Matthew 16, uh, specifically verse 14, where our Lord is asking the apostles, who do men say that I am? And the response comes back from the apostles. Some say John the Baptist, some say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And it's significant that Jeremiah is the one who's mentioned by name as specifically uh, the prophet that our Lord most resembles. And I would definitely agree. We have more, um, biographical information about Jeremiah than any of the other prophets. And uh, a large section, you know, large sections, expanses of the book of Jeremiah are essentially just narratives of the prophet's life, but especially of his sufferings. And this is important. Um, Jeremiah has, uh, you know, he experiences a kind of a passion from about chapters 26 on uh, some scholars, in fact, call that section of the book the Passion of Jeremiah, uh, where we see him in so many ways anticipating uh, the experiences that our Lord undergoes. Um, you know, it, it's it's so dramatic, Tim, that you know we, we're used to thinking of typology in terms of images of the Blessed Mother, so you know Eve and some of the matriarchs, you know, images of Blessed Mother. We're used to thinking of images of the Eucharist or images of our Lord. Our Lord's a new Adam. He's a new David. But the typology in Jeremiah gets so specific that you even have a type of Pontius Pilate. Okay, you got a guy who anticipates, whose character resembles, and that's King Zedekiah. He's this weak-willed civil magistrate. And when you look at his interactions with Jeremiah, you cannot help but, uh, I can't say recollect because... It's not something that happened in the past from the perspective, but pre-collect uh, the, the uh, narrative of our Lord's uh, passion from the gospel, where, um, you know, I also de describe this uh, phenomena as pre vu, okay, where you see something in the Old Testament that makes you think of something that you're going to see later, but not yet. And uh, when you when you look at that interaction between Jeremiah and uh, Zedekiah in the na narratives in the second half of the book, you're just struck by how Zedekiah's personality is so similar to Pilate's. So it's, again, very striking. There's there's lists in, in my uh, textbook on the um, Old Testament, my Catholic introduction to the uh, Bible Old Testament from Ignatius Press. 
um, I have a whole listing of the, um, you know, the, the typological parallels between Jeremiah and our Lord, which are, again, I would argue more specific than, than any of the other prophets. Now, all the prophets in various ways resemble uh, Jesus, but Jeremiah most of all, and especially in his suffering. So what, how can we profit from this book? Well, definitely read with an awareness of how the, um, the prophet's experiences, the events of his life, um, the situation that he's undergoes, you know, are constantly need to be uh, interpreted and and received and contemplated with the life of our Lord, as it were, uh, in the background. Excellent. Yeah, I, that, that was one of the most powerful things that I got out of your class, that section of the, your your major prophets class when I was doing the Emmaus Academy. Let me just read. Th so this is just let me read the, from the Divine Office the appointed text. So every text for every hour of the day during these last two weeks of Lent traditionally are from Jeremiah. So Jeremiah at Lauds, Jeremiah 11, 19, let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof and let us cut him off from the land of the living and his name may no more be remembered. At Terse, Jeremiah 17, 13, Lord, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. At sext, Jeremiah 17, 18, let them be confounded that persecute me, and let but let me not be confounded. Let them be dismayed, but let not me be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil and destroy them with double destruction, O Lord our God. At known, Jeremiah 18, 20, remember that I have stood before them, before thee to speak good for them and to turn away thy wrath from them. And then at Vespers, Jeremiah 11, 20, but O Lord of hosts that judges righteously, that triest the reins and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them for unto thee have I revealed my cause, O Lord, my God. So it seems like he, the suffering servant, which is beseeching the Lord on behalf of the sinners who are persecuting him, but also calling down vengeance on them dramatically <laughs> as well. Uh, any comments on those passages, uh, Dr. Burson? Yeah, yeah, yes, definitely. Um, you know, what uh, immediately it comes to mind that first of all, many of those passages sound like the Psalms, you know, the prophetic nature of the Psalms also remind us of the suffering servant passages from Isaiah. But um, thirdly, um, what you what you have buried within Jeremiah is frequently um, background passages for um, uh, activities or events in our Lord's life, which are not commonly recognized as having a typological background. For example, you read there how um, the evildoers will be written in the earth, you know, and where does our Lord write names in the dirt? Okay, so it makes us think immediately of the account of the adulteress in John 8, uh, but but usually that's forgotten in homiletics or commentaries on John 8. That relationship to uh, Jeremiah is forgotten. Now, Tim Gray mentions this in, in a number of his talks on, on this area. But also in, in another context in um, Luke 5, for example, where uh, our Lord performs the miraculous catch of fish from the boat of Peter. We all remember how Peter drops to his knees and says, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. And Jesus says to him, from now on, you will be fishers of men. So everybody talks about that. Obviously, that means evangelism. But folks forget that Jeremiah 16, 16 has a prophecy that in the future, the Lord is going to send out fishers and hunters to track down the scattered people of God and bring them back. And uh, that, that forms the kind of the prophetic milieu or, or context for understanding our Lord's statement, I'm going to make you fish as a man. Hardly anybody comments on this. So there's, there's a, a kind of a depth to the, um, the, um, you know, the, the prophetic texture of the book of Jeremiah that, that really needs to be mined more both in biblical theology and in popular piety, so that we understand better how our Lord really stands at the culmination of this uh, prophetic tradition as, as the quintessential and the culminating prophet who's kind of summing up everything that came before. We usually get the references to Isaiah because Isaiah is like, you know, he dominates the top 40 list, you know, everybody, you know, 
everybody listens to Isaiah on the air. You know, Jeremiah sings the blues, so he's more of a, a niche uh, uh, market. But we, we got to become more exposed to Jeremiah to to better understand the dynamic in, in many of our Lord's uh, teachings and uh, uh, miracles, etc. Excellent. Yeah, that, that's profound. I didn't see those connections. Some of those that you just mentioned. That's fantastic. Uh, so let me go to a few questions from our guild members in our Bible reading group. Um, this is from Rachel and Wesley. Um, and they're asking about um, the you mentioned the typological relationship with our Lord. Is there also a typological relationship with John the Baptist? Uh, and, and Wesley asked, was the prophet Jeremiah born without original sin similar to uh, St. John the Baptist, as that's that's piously, piously believed that he was, uh, he had some sort of uh, relationship with that, with some, I think he was sanctified in the womb, I think is what some right. that's piously believed. Any comments on John the Baptist's relationship yeah. with Jeremiah? Yeah, um, no, there's, there's uh, definitely a relationship because both Jeremiah and John the Baptist are, in a sense, forerunner prophet figures, right? And uh, John the Baptist undergoes his own passion, you know, that ends in his death. And uh, so you, you, you find that similarity. They can both be understood as precursors um, whose lives in various ways anticipate that of Christ. So is there a relationship? Without a doubt. And that, um, you know, I'll just read a little bit of Jeremiah's call um, because uh, it, it, it does for us uh, trigger um, memories of what is said about G, uh, John the Baptist being uh, cleansed in the womb and leaping in the womb at, uh, you know, the, the words of the Blessed Mother. So in Jeremiah 1.4, we read uh, the Lord speaking to the prophet saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet uh, to the nations. And, and really, all of that could also be said to be true about John the Baptist as well. You know, so that is definitely striking. Now, um, I'm not aware of a church tradition that Jeremiah was cleansed of original sin in the womb. But when we ponder that, you'd have to say that Je uh, Jeremiah 1.4 could be understood as scriptural justification for holding that as a pious belief. Because it does say, before you were born, I consecrated you, right? And, uh, and that term consecrated is quite strong. You know, it's, it's, it's to be made holy. And uh, usually, actually, in, uh, in the Old Testament, that has the, con the, um, the connotations of a priestly uh, role as well. And that's really not, that's not something I've actually pondered with respect to Jeremiah, the possibility of uh, his... Um, his priestly role, but it is true that he comes from Anathoth, which was a priestly city, uh, was given over to the Levites. And this is another um, uh, comparison with John the Baptist, who likewise came from a priestly lineage through his father, Zechariah. So th the, more that, the more that we work at this, the more these parallels between Jeremiah and John the Baptist crop up. So I really think that this is a fruitful area for further you know kind of biblical theological research yeah that, that's fascinating it, that reminds me of what you also say in your course about how he he is a typology jeremiah is a typology of biblical or um, prophetic celibacy as well because some of the other mm -hmm. prophets were married and he's a levite but he's also not only a levite even though the priests were married he is a celibate priest basically yeah. and a prophet so um yeah. so here's an interesting question from rachel she says what is the relationship of Jeremiah with the Ark of the Covenant? In chapter 3, there is a note about the Ark being destroyed around this time, but there is also the tradition that Jeremiah hid the Ark at Mount Nebo, I think. Any comments yes. on the Ark of the Covenant? Yeah, absolutely. So 2 Maccabees says that Jeremiah hid the Ark uh, prior to the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. So he's definitely connected to the Ark, but Jeremiah is almost fam also famous for predicting that in the new covenant era, uh, people will no longer miss the ark. You know, they will no longer say the ark of the Lord, the ark of the Lord. That's really quite dramatic, uh, Tim, for a prophet during the 
um, the Old Testament era. Okay, so the Mosaic Covenant is still in force. We're still definitely a long way from the coming of the Messiah, whom Jeremiah prophesies. But for a prophet to, in that time period, to say, you know, a future is coming when folks are not even going to be concerned about the Ark of the Covenant. What are you talking about? The Ark right. of the Covenant was the center of the liturgy. You could not perform the Day of Atonement liturgy without an Ark, which also, by the way, was a major problem with um, the worship that was going on in the Second Temple period dur during our Lord, because they were performing the Day of Atonement ceremony, but without the Ark, because it had been lost and or hidden. And so um, so Jeremiah predicts that, and, and so that, that that's... That's quite dramatic. And what is that pointing to? You know, I would argue that that's pointing to the fulfillment of the ark in the Blessed Mother, such that we no longer ask about the ark because we're not concerned because we have the what, what the ark symbolized in the Blessed Mother. She is the ark of the new covenant. So Jeremiah is anticipating that. And, uh, and even in a sense, moving salvation history in that direction by, according to 2 Maccabees, hiding the ark in a place where it's it's not going to be found until you know, the, the end of uh, human history, as it were. So, um, yeah, there's definitely a, a connection there. And um, it's, uh, you know, just fascinating to, to ponder that already, you know, you know, 700 years before uh, the coming of our Lord, or 600, you know, depending on your, what, what kind of math you're going to do there, uh, Jeremiah is, is predicting really the retirement of the Old Covenant and its fulfillment by a new one. He is, of course, the only prophet who uses the exact phrase new covenant in Jeremiah 31, 31. And I think that this is an, another thing, Tim, that I think is so important for, for us as Catholic readers of Jeremiah to grasp. And that is that we are Christians not because we dismiss or we throw out the Old Testament books and especially the Old Testament prophets. Rather, we are Christians because we believe them. We believe the Old Testament books. We believe the Old Testament prophets. We believe Jeremiah. And Jeremiah himself says that the old Mosaic covenant is going to be retired and replaced by a new one. Now, in, in uh, contemporary theology, that's often called supersessionism. And it's really unpopular nowadays to talk about that, to describe the Mosaic covenant as being retired. You know, and, and, and it's, a, it's often, a, it's laid on St. Paul's uh, responsibility. And St. Paul is, uh, you know, accused of coming up with the idea that there is a new covenant that's going to replace the Mosaic one. And of course, you know, for the sake of ecumenical relations and so on, we don't want to talk about the retirement of the Mosaic covenant. But it's predicted by the Israelite prophets themselves, okay? This is not, not Christians coming up with this. This is Jeremiah, whose language is so close to the book of Deuteronomy that some scholars have proposed that it was Jeremiah who wrote the book of Deuteronomy, the climactic book of Moses in, in the Pentateuch. Of course, that's not true. Um, you know, Moses wrote Deuteronomy and, and Jeremiah imbibed uh, that book and, and uh, reflects the language of Deuteronomy throughout his book. But, um, you know, we, again, we are Christians because we believe the Old Testament. We believe that what the prophets spoke is true and it was fulfilled in Christ, and, and we stand on their testimony. Our Lord himself says, if you believed Moses, you would believe in me, because he wrote about me. And that is the conviction of uh, you know, the, the Catholic faithful. We, uh, we don't pit Moses and Jesus against one another. Rather, we believe them both, because their testimony agrees. Yeah, the early church is, is just an oral tradition interpreting the Law and the Prophets. And then the New Testament comes later, and so right. the the Lord Himself founds the church, and He said, He said, as as the Emmaus Road says, how uh, how foolish and slow of heart to believe all the law the prophets have have right. declared. Uh, do you think that because the, the thing I just thought of when you said Deuteronomy, because the thing that's always struck me when Moses predicts the coming of the prophet like me, and right. what makes Moses as a prophet different than all the other prophets. Because they could have said, well, Jeremiah, are you the prophet like Moses? Or Isaiah, are you the prophet? But Moses is a prophet, but also a lawgiver. 
and all the other prophets don't really do that until Jesus is the new Moses. And he says, you have heard it said, but I say to you, and then he is giving a new law. So he's truly the new Moses, which I see as a parallel passage to there will be a new covenant. Yeah. What are your thoughts on what was the connection, Jeremiah and Deuteronomy? Oh, oh yeah. Strong connection. So, um, Jeremiah, you know, Deuteronomy, um, and Jeremiah are um, one of the two most closely linked books uh, in the Old Testament. And um, the language of Deuteronomy is repeated, arguably, more in Jeremiah than any other uh, Old Testament book. Um, so Jeremiah is constantly lifting lines from Deuteronomy and redeploying them in his own context. You can kind of look at Deuteronomy as like the last will and testament of Moses, the great prophet of Israel. And then Jeremiah comes later as like an executor lawyer who reads the will and uh, disposes of the estate. And so Jeremiah comes to kind of execute the, the curses especially that Deuter that uh, Moses called down on the people of Israel, should they be unfaithful to the covenant? And of course they are. And Jeremiah lives through the experience of the final curses falling on the people of Israel for having disobeyed the covenant that God gave them through Moses. And he watches Jerusalem, uh, you know, be besieged. He sees the famine, the cannibalism, et cetera, that was predicted in Deuteronomy 28. He sees that fall down upon the people. And so, and, and he's the one who points this out and, uh, you know, um, convicts the people of having uh, violated the covenant and triggered these curses. So there's a very strong relationship. And I would point out, especially um, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, you have to read kind of the context of Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, starting from verse 1 through verse 6. And you'll see that there Moses prophesies the future of the people of God in broad strokes. And he says, when all these things happen to you, the blessing and the curse, the blessing was experienced under David and Solomon. The curse was experienced after Solomon all the way until the decline and the exile. And then Moses goes on and says, and when you call all these things to mind, among the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. And so Mo Moses is saying there, you're definitely going to get exiled and you're going to get scattered and, you know, in, in, in captivity. And then he says, if you repent, the Lord will bring you back and he will restore your prosperity more than your fathers. And then it continues down into verse six, verse six. And it says, the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your offspring. That is the closest that Moses gets. Well, it, I don't like to say closest, but that is where Moses himself predicts a new covenant. Because circumcision was a covenant-making ritual, as we see from Genesis 17. So when Moses talks about the circumcision of the heart, he's talking about a supernatural covenant that's going to come, that's going to replace his own covenant, which was tied to circumcision of the body. And this time is going to come when God circumcises the heart. This is going to be a covenant that's made in the interior person. And then God is going to enable his people, as you continue reading in Deuteronomy 30, to keep the law. And all of this is talking ultimately about baptism. And that prediction by, uh, by uh, Moses of the cutting of the heart, of the circumcision of the heart, is really fulfilled in Acts 2.38 when it describes Pentecost. And after the assembled crowds of Israelites yeah. from all over the world listen to the preaching of Peter, it says they were cut to the heart and they said, brethren, what must we do to be saved? And that is a, a key intertextual link where we realize that this now, that the movement of the Holy Spirit to bring the people of Israel into the new covenant through Pentecost is the fulfillment of what Moses had spoken back in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. And it's also the fulfillment of what Jeremiah himself uh, said in Jeremiah 31, 31, 
When Jeremiah says, the days are coming, says the Lord God, when I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, where is Jeremiah getting the idea that God's going to send a new covenant one day? He's getting it from Moses, who himself predicted that there's going to be a new circumcision, not of the body, but of the heart. And, and um, uh, Jeremiah himself speaks of the uh, circumcision of the heart on, in a couple of other occasions uh, within his book. So we really see that Moses and Jeremiah are agreed. They're both speaking in, in using slightly different language, but they're both speaking of a new covenant that's going to come one day. And that really comes to culmination. Um, interestingly, you know, in a, in a certain sense, at the Last Supper, where our, where our Lord uh, speaks of making the new covenant in uh, Luke 22, 20, for example, but then also in um, at Pentecost, where, you know, 3,000 are welcomed into the covenant through baptism. And uh, baptism is the circumcision of the heart, as we later uh, read in um, the later verses of Colossians chapter 1, where uh, St. Paul describes um, uh, baptism as the circumcision not made by hands. Uh, but we're, again, at Pentecost, where those 3,000 are baptized, that's where their hearts are circumcised, and that's the beginning of, you know, kind of the explosion of the new covenant that uh, that Moses himself foresaw. Wow. This is riveting. I, I love what you put out about Jeremiah, because that's, that's you mentioned in the class how under King Josiah, they found the book of the law, which was probably Jer or Deuteronomy, and then right. Jeremiah laying it down. And I just looked up Acts 2.37, and the Greek says, um, gisan, which is pierced or stung to the heart. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, it, I, I, and I love what you say in the class. You talk, title all the wind of the Eucharist, because when the Lord says, this is the blood of the New Testament, he's just quoting Moses when he said, this is the blood of the covenant in Exodus, except he's adding the word new. So he's doing the same thing Moses did starting the new covenant with the blood, with his own blood. Uh, this is fantastic. Let, let me ask one last question um, from Wesley. He says, um, what's the context around Jeremiah 29? 29 11 is a very popular Bible verse, the Protestant and Catholic for the Protestant and Catholic world, and would be interesting to hear the Catholic commentary about it. it seems like when I was a Protestant, they would quote 29 11, which is, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper for you, et cetera. This is when Jeremiah is sending out this letter of comfort to the exiles. Um, and it seems that they are, Protestants are quoting this in a very subjective sense, which is true, of course, mm -hmm. um, and kind of ties into this circumcision of the heart we we're talking a little bit about. Can you, but can you comment on, give us a Catholic context for 2911? Yes, absolutely. So, um, it's good to bring in uh, Jeremiah 29.10 um, as well, uh, where Jeremiah says, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Uh, that, that promise of Jeremiah 70 years becomes very significant in uh, the flow of salvation history. Later, we find out in Daniel chapter 9 that at the conclusion of the 70 years, uh, for Babylon, when Babylon fell and was replaced by Persia, the prophet Daniel prays for the fulfillment of this promise that Jeremiah gave in Jeremiah 29. And the answer that he receives from God through the prophet Gabriel is kind of a good news, bad news response. Um, Gabriel comes and says, um, you know, the good news is uh, what you're asking for is going to be fulfilled. The bad news is it's going to take seven times longer okay, than, uh, than was prophesied by Jeremiah. And that's according to a principle that goes all the way back to Moses and uh, Leviticus chapter 26, a principle that if God punishes and you don't repent, you will be punished seven times over. And so uh, the angel Gabriel in Daniel 9 says, uh, the, the period of probation or of penance is going to be extended, Daniel, by a factor of seven. So no longer 70 years, but 70 times seven, or about 490 years, roughly 500 years. And that is roughly the time span between uh, the Babylonian exile and the coming of our Lord. And so that becomes very important in salvation history. And so if we look in the context of Jeremiah 29, you know, we can, you know, 
we can we can take it and we can pray it and apply it to ourselves and that's all well and good and that's what our protestant brothers do and there's that's not wrong necessarily um, but the original context is really talking about the people of God as a nation, the people of God as a body, and how that this uh, this time of penance uh, is eventually going to come to a close. And these plans for welfare and future and a hope are actually associated with the Messiah. It's the coming of the Messiah that's going to be uh, that's going to bring welfare, uh, a future, a hope. Uh, God's presence, restoration of blessing, etc. So this is the inbreaking of, of the new covenant. Now, despite all that, you know, we we as Catholics would say, granted, there are many senses of Scripture. There's the literal sense, there's the allegorical sense, there's the moral sense, there's the anagogical sense. So I would say the the literal sense of this text is, you know, Jeremiah predicting that uh, the people are eventually going to return from Babylon and have their fortunes restored allegorically we see it in light of christ and we see that these plans for a future and welfare are really associated with the coming of the messiah and jesus's uh inauguration of the new covenant but when we get to the moral sense that's like how does it apply to my life and it's true that christians in the contemporary area era where we live in a kind of social exile where the christian nations the christian republics and the christian kingdoms of of Europe and of other uh, places, you know, at one time, you know, Latin America was a was a Christian landmass politically, etc. Um, you know, all of that has dissolved, and so virtually all Christians are living under um, essentially secular regimes around the world. We do not have the political power that we had in certain areas and at certain times. Uh, uh, earlier in Christian history. And so we're all living in a kind of exile, as Dr. Hahn has been expounding upon, uh, you know, on his Sunday reflections during this Lent. And so in that situation of, of exile, we can be tempted to give up hope, just throw in the towel, head for the hills, etc. I'm just going to hide out with myself and my family and, and hope that time and tide turns at some point. And, uh, and Jeremiah really speaks to us in this condition and say it says you know don't don't take uh the option of uh you know placing your head in the sand in the sand and trying to avoid um all contact with uh with external uh, society uh, but take hope and uh, be encouraged because the lord always has plans for the good of his people and um and, and that is no less true today than it has been in the past um, yes, we're in a kind of a political exile, but we also have Christ present, body, blood, soul, and divinity with us all the time uh, in the Eucharist. We have the power of the sacraments. Uh, we have the prayers of the saints. Um, we have uh, the powers of spiritual warfare uh, that are still resident in the church, and everybody knows it because when if, when anybody comes across a demon-possessed person, they call for a Catholic priest. It's kind of a universal recognition that right. only the Catholic Church has true authority in spiritual warfare. So there's many reasons uh, for hope and for boldness, uh, even in the situation that we uh, find ourselves in. Fantastic. This is a great way to end this. Um, th this is, you You just, um, you had just illuminated the whole uh musical intro of this whole podcast is right. the lay apostolate theme because it starts with a painting of the babylonian exile That's and that. then it's then it has the the Macca conception which is which is a which is an icon of joachim and anna kissing which is the Macca conception and then we have the betrothal of, of mary and joseph which is all taking place in that 490 span there right. uh so this is this is the this is the beauty of uh uh god's providential plan indeed I, I was struck by that absolutely watching the intro I was thinking wow this is very jeremianic <laughs> yeah <laughs> perfect wow wonderful well dr Bergsma, it's been a pleasure and honor as always thanks for coming on i hope to have you have you back on in the fall when we read through ezekiel and oh. daniel oh, uh, I love, I love one of the toughest ones for sure so yeah. Uh, look forward to that. So, Dr. Bergsma, go make everybody make sure you go to the link below. Sign up for Emmaus Academy. You'll you'll your your mind will thank you for the formation you get at a at a steel price. So, uh, go to Emmaus Academy. So, with that, let's let's invoke Our Lady, and uh, we'll close out here. Let me pull up our um, 
our icon. This is the Russian icon of Fatima that we use here. Okay, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.